I'm very sad to have seen him leave the fold of CFA, but I'm sure if I can rope him back into this, uh, he'll be a great mentor for a lot of people. So, Rog, I'm looking for you to come back. <laughs> I'm just a support person, Tony. Good on you, mate. Um, so the, I'm going to try and share a bit of a PowerPoint presentation because you know, a typical CFA just want to kill you with PowerPoint. Um, so we, we, still, we still do that, even though we're doing it remotely. Um, I'll click on this and see if it works, Sarah. Yeah, we got anything? Yep. Is that out there? Yeah, it's in um, kind of working desktop mode. Not right, in the so I'll just try and start it as a slideshow. Should I have my microphone off, by the way? No, keep giving me advice. So can we all see that? Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> all right, so Plan Burn Task Force Phase 2. Uh, phase 1, well, that was interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, I can't see shows of hands or anything else like that, but I'll, um, I'll, uh, if you've got questions, just yell out and, and I'll, I'm happy to answer them as we go. Um, but basically, about three years ago, um, we were working in the space with Safer Together and we were looking at ways to how we can improve and enhance our burning operations with volunteers. Because we've got, you know, there's been a number of reports and Roger has actually been involved in commissioning a couple of those um, about how we, how we do things a bit differently and how we can improve our capacity to do planned burning. Um, and you've got no doubt with the fires over in uh, Gippsland and the Royal Commission going on, there's a big focus on planned burning and, and there's gonna be a, a, an additional focus on it. And, I, and if CFA wants to play in that space, well, we've actually got to look at how we can do it better and achieve more. And, I, and there's no doubt that uh, our volunteers do a fantastic job in um, su supporting suppression activities. And you've only got to look at the amount of volunteers that rolled over uh, into Gippsland and the amount of effort was put in by the, the Vols over there this year in firefighting is, is quite incredible. So I suppose what we did was take it, what we've been doing, and that's why I've got that slide there, taking a new approach to doing the things we always do. Because what we always do really well is that we support each other. Um, and it doesn't matter if I'm in Ballarat or Sabas or you're in Bansdale, um, if the call goes out for help, we generally pick up, uh, pick up the tools and we head off and we help each other. So um, it, it, it's no, no doubt that we, we, we call for the response. I think the thing that we're gonna look at is um, how important is fire prevention? And part of fire prevention is actually doing plan burning. And is that as important as putting the fire out? Because I think if we took a, bit, uh, a pretty strong focus on um, prevention, um, then we might have an opportunity to reduce some of the requirements we have around suppression. And um, we do that, as I said, we do the suppression part fairly hard and fairly long, um, but we don't do a lot of the, the prevention work all that well. So we got an opportunity to get some money and uh, in the first, first bite of the cherry, uh, I put a project plan together and I'll see if I can get this thing to work for me. And um, we t we off we went a, a couple of years ago, and we rolled it out by going out to uh, four districts, five districts, and we wrote to every volunteer basically, and we said, "This is what we're proposing. We're going to come up with a plan burn task force. Um, if you want to be a member, uh, here's a form. Fill it out with your captain's approval, and send it back." Now you didn't, the criteria was that you had to be an experienced firefighter. You didn't have to be uh, well versed in plan burning, but you had to have the minimum skills of um, obviously around has tree and entrapment. And we built up a database. And then what we did was we, we went to the OMs before we went to the captains and said, can we have your permission to come into your district and send a letter out to every volunteer? So we went, to 8, 13, 14, 15 initially. 
and we sent letters, about 9,000 letters out. So a fair bit of uh, envelope licking. And then the first cut, when we did that first, we got about 320 people came back and signed up and said, yep, we want to be in on this. Um, and what you're looking there is a photo of one of the first burns we did over Ballarat. Um, and just so happened it was in Ballarat because I come from here, so it makes it easy for me to do it. And it was a, a, a really good successful day. We burnt uh, about 100 hectares of bush. And, and if I'll give you a little bit of history about it, um, local, it was a midweek burn on a Tuesday. And we said, well, how do we do this? Local brigades were requested to resource it. They were able to supply one truck and about half of another. And we wanted to have five trucks there. So we put the call out to man up the other three trucks. Uh, and those people you see in that photo came from 813 all around the place. Uh, no one was from any one brigade. Uh, they answered the call, we brought them over to Ballarat. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit further. And we got in and we cracked in for three days and got the burn done. And every one of those people went away saying how good it was, how, um, how much they learned, how much they enjoyed it and what the interaction was. And I will tell you that none of them, uh, when we went back to the hotel that night, I don't think too many of them wanted to sit up and drink because they were all stuffed. Um, they, worked their buggers, they worked their bums off and uh, it was pretty hard work for the day. So what, what's the project about? We run the pilot and that was the first part of it. Uh, our process developed up for volunteer engagement and registration. And then we, we set up uh, in that first round, we, it, we proved that it worked. Um, we, we had people when we, we put out about six requests for crews uh, on that first uh, incident in that first pilot. And we were able to fill every request and everybody came, came along for the ride. So uh, last year, uh, Save It Together came along again and I was able to convince them in Melbourne that if we keep working this way, we'll, we'll enhance our ability to deliver plan burning. So I wrote up another paper and uh, we grabbed uh, a bit more money to keep going for another 12 months. Uh, you really don't need to um, get too much into what the uh, project plan was, but look, the rationales and all that were set up that we, we're often, we're not available at short notice a lot of times. Plan burning is subject to weather. Um, and, you know, that's, if you live in Gippsland or live in Ballarat or wherever, weather's a fickle beast. Uh, you never know whether it's going to rain, snow or cook your bum. So... And the other thing is a volunteer. Well, and I've been a volunteer for 35 years. We have a job to go to. So if you want to burn on a Wednesday, you put the call out and uh, three quarters of your brigade are working um, and they can't get there. How do you get the burn done? So this was all part of the, the concept around the plan burn task force. So we, we, we've been working up a, a database. Um, we had an aim to get to 500. And I will tell you, with this year, we went out to districts uh, 2, 7, 6, 22, 12, um, and there's one other in there I can't remember. And we've now built the database up to a bit over 500. Uh, I think it's about 580. So response to me has been really good. Um, we're now, uh, you know, we're in a bit of a dormant season. And part of my getting onto your um, um, conference today is to actually be able to say, well, we're going to look now to give um, all other districts an opportunity to join up if they want to. Um, we'll have to have a talk to the OMs in each of those districts to make sure that we've got their approval. Uh, but what we'll then do is we'll, we won't be doing um, 17,000 uh, envelopes this time we'll be sending the information out to each brigade secretary and captain and with the expression of interest form and we'll hopefully that information will get out to brigade volunteers. In the meantime, um, if you want to want more information, um, you can always come back directly to me. We can send you an expression of interest form 
there's no, um, there's nothing to preclude you from joining up now. Uh, other than that, you need your captain's approval and that has to be endorsed by the operations manager. <coughs> Excuse me, I haven't got um, Corona. I've got a really sore throat though. Uh, so we've, we've, we, uh, what we've been doing, we've got a project team uh, reduced to two. Uh, we had a really good bloke from Delp uh, working with us initially. Um, Mr. Tarsane, Richard Tarsane, some of you might know him from over the uh, over Gippsland, who works for Delp, and uh, he was a great supporter. But unfortunately, he had to go back. I think he's, some of you may know him, I think he's a regional manager, Rog, is that be right? Uh, over in Delp land, over in Gippsland somewhere. Uh, I think that's right. Sarah could advise us there. Yeah, Sarah. He's, yeah. He, he's actually working with the uh, Bushfire Recovery Victoria guys at the moment. Is he? Yeah. 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 So he, he was a great help. He was really uh, a great supporter and a really a great advocate for, for what we were trying to do. So we reviewed the paging system. And one of the things we it's become really evident to us is that I reckon probably 60% of the bug gauge out there use BART. Um, CFA doesn't support BART, but if you've got it, when we set up your pager into our CAP group, we give you the CAP codes there. If you've got your brigade coordinator, they can put the um, they can put it into your BART system and, and you can be notified if you join. But but at the moment, we can't do it. BART wanted me to pay them a lot of money to use their system for the task force and we, we couldn't do it. Um, there's a new supplementary um, system coming out, you've all probably heard about it, and we'll look to be using that next year. So we developed a phase two project plan, and we went to the uh, state control, uh, project control board, and we got about $400,000. Now, the, the sounds like a, money, a lot of money, but it's about supporting people to go away. And if you work on the basis that running a plan burn on a daily operation, fully crewed, uh, with food, accommodation, everything else like that, runs up at around $800 per head per person. So if you're running away 20 people for the day, uh, it's nothing to be spending, you know, 10,000 bucks. And I'll explain that a bit further. We're looking at reviewing our engagement strategy, hence why I'm talking to you tonight. Um, uh, social media and that, we, I'm a bit of an old fart and I uh, haven't been a great user of social media and it takes people like Sarah and that to point me in the right direction, but we need to be able to communicate better and get more of the message out there. Uh, I did mention that we expanded the program to 2, 6, 7, 20 and 22. Uh, 7,000 letters. And we're uh, ongoing testing of pager systems we're maintaining interest with volunteers. We've got a designated newsletter. Uh, we're setting up a designated Facebook page and we continue to communicate with captains. So we'll be going out on that. that uh, and we're deployment ready at the moment. So that's where we're at, we are um, and where we're going. Uh, our approval for the project continues. Um, we, we've developed a new project plan. We've got, I've got a, a staff of one, um, which is uh, Mel Wood. And the majority of times, if you've got inquiries around uh, the Plan Burn Task Force, uh, they'll go through Mel or you can come direct to me. But Mel, because I'm also a vegetation management officer, I've got a substantive role as well. So I'm going to try and look after that a bit. And we, we, we want to continue to engage, expand our resources. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, because we've got a view that um, if we get uh, a lot of plan burning and we get the right weather conditions and that, and there's a, uh, a significant request for burns, we, we, we've done some sort of projections that if we, the bigger the base of pool of people we've got, at any given time, we're hoping to have 10% availability. Now, if we've got 600 in there and we get 10% on a day when we send out a page, that means we get 60 people back. If we've got three burns that need resourcing in different parts of the state, that's only 20 people per burn. That, they'll get absorbed very quickly. As you know, when you're sending away multiple strike teams, you're talking about thousands of people. Well, we're, 
really small compared to that. But it, um, if we can do it right, and we can get people out there, we'll, 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 we'll reach something. Um, Tony, we've got a question just here. Yep, go ahead, Sarah. Um, from Rob Stebbing, if we are yep. already registered with the Plan Burn Task Force, do we have to register each year or for phase two? No, uh, so if you're not a member at the moment, uh, you can get the EI phone. Once you've registered, what we it, it's like you're being a registered member of the CFA. Uh, we don't have access to RMS or the system. So what we do is we, we, re, we, we go through the approval process. You send it in, uh, provided it's signed by your captain. After we, we then send it back to the catchment officers for endorsement. And then we get your page and we put your, the cap code in the, or we activate the cap code into your pager. And then we also take your mobile phone for SMS. So you automatically go in and we give you access to the Facebook page. Is that answering the question? I think he was asking, once you register, do you register for life or do you have to re register each year or when you get up to? Uh, you're, you, well, you're registered to life until you tell us you, you don't want to be there anymore. So we, we, um, we, we, we don't, we don't have the capacity to monitor. It's like you're a brigade member. If you resign or you decide you don't want anything more to do with the brigade, it takes a bit to get you out of the system. Um, one of the problems we're finding at the moment is um, um, you, you join a brigade, you've got a pager, you're registered with us and you're in the plan burn task force and you've left the brigade and that page has gone to another member. Uh, if we don't get that feedback, we can't change it. Um, so we might be paging out members of, uh, not members of the task force. So we've, we're, we're trying to resolve that. But once you join, nah, you're in there until you tell us you've had enough. Does that make sense? Thanks, Tony. It's all good. Yep. So we're, we're out here. We're, we're trying to promote. Now, normally I'd, I'd, I'd uh, hopefully be holding this um, meeting in a hall over somewhere over in your part of the world, Bansdale, wherever. Where are you, Sarah Bansdale? Yep, Bansdale. Yeah. Well, I would have looked forward to having a nice trip over to Bansdale and having a couple of beers there as well and lubricating the throat. But um, uh, unfortunately, that's not to be. So we, we will be trying to do more promotion. And part of that promotion is, g'day, guys. I've got uh, 25 there at the moment, I think, Sarah. Um, I'm hoping you guys will go out and promote this. So, and what we're looking to improve. We want to make sure that the task force is recognised statewide and we want people to use it. Um, so one of the biggest problems we'll have, if we've got 600 people, people, 600 people sitting there ready to go and we haven't got burns planned and ready to happen, um, or the groups or the brigade, local brigades don't, you know, don't step up and want to undertake plan burning. That's going to be a problem going forward in the future. And I, to be quite honest with you, see if I will either have to work at either doing plan burning and training and looking after its people, or we might as well give it all to FMV. And, um, you know, I'm not going to pull any punches on that. Um, and there will be, uh, th there's been a number of um, bushfire risk, risk landscape projects going around that have identified that no matter how much the, um, the Crown does work on their estate in plan burning, there'll be a residual risk left on private land. And unless we do something to help and manage that, then we will always be defeated. So in your part of the world over there, you've got Chris Lewis and John Crane, and I believe there's been a new appointment as a VMO just recently, um, April, and I, I apologise if somebody... Uh, Knows her and I don't, um, but she's been appointed out of Morwell in the last um, last week or so. So uh, Chris Lewis is probably more your local, I would have thought, Sarah. Yes, he is. <clears throat> We've got uh, people from right across the state on here tonight, Tony. So it's not. It's like, well, it's only those people great. from across the state. That's great, and uh, and Stephanie over there as well. She does a great job. So yep. what we want to do is uh, keep promoting the task force. We want to make sure all our operational staff that have uh, in the catchments and that have uh, a visibility around us. 
so that they can have that talk with the captains and the groups where they want to get plant burning done. So we utilize you guys. Uh, and I suppose at the end of the day, we'll keep to maintain the database and our future. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll assess the value of this project by the end of next year. Um, if we can continue to um, um, produce, i.e. getting out there doing the burning, well, I think we'll become business as usual. That's my hope. Uh, we'll automate the database because at the moment it's fairly clunky. That's just Mel and myself managing it. Uh, we want to keep going around the, the fact that we want to promote it, the utilisation of the task force to districts. And we want to have the whole state involved. We don't want to just have um, 10 districts. We want every, every volunteer to have the opportunity. And if they want to come on, that's great. And transition to BAU. Now, Rudy? Yep. Sorry, um, we've just had a question from Daniel. Where can we access nomination forms and, um, and or your Facebook page? Yep. Um, the Facebook page will be coming online. I haven't, we, we're, just, we're about to go online very shortly with that. In the meantime, if you want the uh, nomination forms and the information, Sarah, um, I'll send you through um, some information on that that you can post on the website. So but basically, if you email Mel, and it's m.wood, for those that you um, have got a pen handy with you, uh, m.wood at cfa.vic.gov.au, if you email Mel, she will send you expressions of interest form, uh, Q&A, and just a, a, a bit of a brief on the uh, Plan Burn Task Force. So that's the way to get additional information at the moment. And I'll send that to you, Sarah, and you can post it on your Facebook page at the moment as well. Is that all good? Yeah, not a problem. Okay, so how it works, um, as I said, we need we need districts and groups and people to call on us. What happens if we get we, when we get a request? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll use Chris Lewis for example. Chris wants to do a burn, or a brigade wants to do a burn. They're talking to Chris, and they got a good weather cycle coming through. They got a week's opportunity to do a burn, and they know that they haven't got enough crew locally. They can't raise enough crew. So in consultation with the catchment officer, they send the plan burn task force a request and they nominate what they want. Crew leaders, truck drivers, chainsaw operators, uh, and how many crew they want. The trucks must be supplied locally. The appliances come from the local contingent. So we just send the people. Uh, they'll man up on the local trucks and possibly with a local operator. So you might have just a driver of the truck or local person, because as you know, brigades like to keep ownership of their vehicles, um, but we just go there and support them. We're a human resource. We then, once we get that request, we send out a page message, and we look when we get the response back, we populate what the request is by those, we get the information from your EIO, and we try and make sure that we give rotation as many people as an opportunity. So. If I was applying all the time, um, I wouldn't get to go to every single burn. A bit like strike team deployments. Couple we of then, we then... Oh, sorry. sorry, Tony, we've got a couple of questions if you want them. Yep. Um, is there a direct link into the JFMP and planning for joint agency resources? No. Excellent. And do the task force burns provide training and mentoring opportunities? Yeah, well, I'd love to get Roger Strickland back in on that one. <laughs> but um, uh, the task force, ta um, the task force budget has um, um, funding available for to develop some training opportunities. And whilst we haven't fleshed that out at the moment, quite uh, be quite frank with you on that, uh, we want to work with training and different groups and districts regions to see if we can't facilitate um, instructors going out to some of the burns to provide both mentoring and instruction around planned burning. Um, so that we will be looking to do that definitely, Sarah, um, as part of an ed educative process as we go forward. That to me, there's nothing, no greater um, trainer than being on the ground with the smoke and the flames. Now, you may not get a qualification out of it, 
but you'll get that indirect, uh, that learning outcome by actually being part of it. So hopefully we will be able to get some instructors out there with groups when we send them away. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, Rog. Uh, can I support you with the mentoring value for these trips? Uh, been watching, if you're watching the uh, National Inquiry into Emergencies catastrophes at the moment going on in New South Wales. Planned burning comes up, of course, and, uh, and a discussion about the difference between back burns and planned burns. Sure, there is a difference, but to gain expertise at doing back burns, which is deliberate burning in emergency conditions, the hardest possible way to do it, um, it's really important that our members gain experience with planned burning in controlled conditions or mild conditions. It's, it's the underpinning knowledge and it's also hugely valuable for all sorts of other reasons, supervising crews, just uh, generally task force operations. You don't always get the opportunity to, to have a go at that and here this is just yet another op planned opportunity to take advantage of. So I'd uh, commend regards to consider it for those members who can make themselves available. And uh, finally, uh, it's the training on the job that, in my view, is the most valuable, above all, above the theory training, which is important. It's the training on the job that really cements it all home. So again, commend uh, brigades to consider this as a valuable opportunity. Thank you. No worries, Rog. Thank you for those good words. Um, I could bore you with a lot more photos about plan burning, and I'm not going to do that because I don't want to keep everybody up and awake at night time. So, once we get the call, I'll just go running through the process. Um, we'll send out, we'll develop up uh, very quickly. Once you come back and tell us where we're going, we'll, we'll advise you where, where the dispatch is to. So if you're in Bansdale, it might be to um, Macclesfield or wherever. Um, you know, might, we, we have an expectation that you will drive your own vehicle. So you'll get motel type accommodation in close proximity to wherever the burn is. All your meals will be supplied and you will be paid. Uh, now I just got to remember off the top of my head, I think it's 80 or 72 cents a kilometer to drive to the, to the location. So if you're driving a hundred Ks and a hundred Ks back, you'll get 140 bucks to go to the burn. Now we don't pay you to go away and strike food because we put you on the bus. But in this instance, we, we look to, for you to drive your own vehicle. Um, if you're away, if you go a couple hundred k's, um, you know, I know I had people down there, I'm not saying this is payment, but you know, at the end of the day, we had people that were coming 200 k's um, away and it was 300 bucks. They, they ended up uh, getting in there for their car allowance. Now you can view that whichever way you like. Um, but at the end of the day, it does give you, you you're not using, you're not even expected to do it absolutely free. Yeah, is that fair enough? You can either argue with me or disagree with me on that one, um, but that, that's what we've put in place. Um, you'll, there'll be a nominated uh, crew leader with you, um, so it'll be a mix and match. Um, the crews that we sent away this year, we had um, people from, uh, I think I did one burn down near Colac, uh, down near, um, uh, Geelong, we went down there, we had uh, 12 people from 10 different stations and they all got on with, got on with each other, got onto the job and, 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 and we achieved over a couple of days and they went home and in that period of time, over the two days burns we had there, we ended up burning um, 32 kilometres of roadside, which would, would not have happened uh, this year without the assistance of the task force. So, um, any questions, I suppose? That's about the nuts and guts yeah. of it very quickly. There's a couple of questions here. Um, yeah. First of all, can we double check on that email because apparently it's bounced back? Okay. It's m.wood at cfa.vic.gov.au. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. That's that one. The next question is um, from Rod again. We have a... We have received last week a request from VFBB for feedback on a new draft SOP for planning and conduct plan burning. 
Yep. Craft suggests only operational staff employed under the EBA will be able to plan and conduct burns after July 1st. This is not clear. Can you put any context around this draft? Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I'm probably going to get myself into the poo here, but I've never been backwards and coming forward. Um, I also, as part of an employee, I'm PTA staff, I'm not operational staff, but I'm on the consultative committee. And we raised that uh, SOP as a grievance level and we've totally rejected it. So does that answer your question? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to it personally for a number of reasons. Um, secondly, the context and the intent of that scope doesn't clearly flesh out what the PTA staff, what the likes of me, can do with that. Um, so it's going to be uh, further discussion around that SOP. So it's not one that it's being accepted at the moment. Um, uh, my view is personally that when there will be a change after January 1st of July, uh, that there is no question about that. And there will be a greater focus on CFA to do plan burning. Now, in that space, uh, that is going to be, a, a, it's going to be the volunteers that are going to have to do it. Not going to be operational staff, because VFA, VF, F, FRV are not going to be playing in the country area and they're not going to be playing in the bush. So it's, our, it's going to be um, predominantly, well, not predominantly, it's going to be volunteers. And at the end of the day, if volunteers want to do it, well, if they see it important, they will. If they don't, they won't do it. So yeah, we will either will either have that choice, or the, and I think uh, you know for the brigades that are um, uh, are going to lose some of their their requirements because maybe they're in integrated station areas or FRV areas, this may provide a greater opportunity for them to provide service and get out there and make it, uh, an impact. Um, I don't know, so but but I'm. But my answer to the SOP is that no, uh, I know it went to VFBV. I, um, I um, wonder why it went out before it was properly consulted on. Um, and that's not up for me to decide. Um, but um, yeah, it, it is subject at the moment to ongoing consultation through the, uh, um, the uh, industrial forum. Got it from Mark Dryden, Tony. Um, uh, this is public knowledge, it's nothing confidential. Mark Dryden as the State um, Executive Officer for VFBB was formally presented it from CFA Management. Yep. Uh, we were given it last Tuesday and District 13 were told we had till close of business yesterday to have it in. So we were able to consult. We've got 37 of our 47 brigades and uh, everyone's actually quite concerned about that SOP. So you're saying it's subject of a grievance by PTA staff? Uh, at, at the moment, the agreement was, well, when I was at the, Rob, when I was at the uh, Consultative Committee uh, uh, 10 days ago, we raised it as a matter of um, in dispute. Uh, we asked for it to be put on hold and not to be progressed any further. And we asked that further consultation be taken place with it. Uh, I had an undertaking at that time from CFA that that would occur and we would go back to the table around that SOP. And I also indicated uh, in my position as an employee delegate, that if the matter was to be progressed any further, we would lodge a grievance with fair work. Because I don't, it, it's definitely not something that, that I personally accept. And I know that the other vegetation management officers, vegetation management support officers, and others in the plan burning space do not accept it at all. And I'll, I'm not gonna go in and uh, in depth as to where that that letter in the scope, where, where how that sentence in the scope um, came about, but I'm sure you can work that out for yourself. Yeah, I I, I do want to say, and I'll, I'll apologise to the to the forum tonight. I certainly don't want to use this as a platform to politicise the issue at all. I don't think it's appropriate, and I'm not going to comment on industrial matters. It was just that the SOP that went out to our 47 brigades over the weekend clearly said that uh, only the employees under the staff agreement would be conducting the planning burning. So as a task force member, I was aghast myself, actually. 
we yep. have back to say, what does this actually mean? And it certainly doesn't. It certainly doesn't mean that from a volunteer's perspective, Rod. I can give you that assurance. It doesn't mean that, no. but it's going to be. It's going to be subject to further consultation. So I'll just leave that where it sits for the moment. And I'm happy with that. I don't want to take up any. Yep. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate that. Thanks. No worries. Uh, got any more questions there, Sarah? No, no more that have come through. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Tony? No, all right. Um, well, I, I, all I can say to you is uh, watch this space. We will be sending, as soon as I do, further consultation with the uh, AFCOs or I, I, OMs out there um, and get their approval to go out. We will send emails out with all the literature. But in the meantime, go to that. Yeah, feel free to send us an email and we will send you out more relevant information about it. Um, so we are in a deve developmental stage. Uh, there's two things that underpin our success. One is that CFA wants to do more plan burning. And I think there's, there's plenty of evidence to say that a lot of people do. And there's gonna be plenty of push to actually see if we can do more. I mean, uh, um, you know, a, a famous old chief officer, I think was one of our better ones for a long time was Ewan Ferguson. And he made it very clear that if you own the fuel, you own the, what was the w w words, Rog? If you own the fuel, you own the problem. And um, if we don't deal with the fuel, then we're always going to have problems. You own the fuel, you own the fire. That's it. Yeah. So if we don't actually do, you know, like a plan burn only has a certain limit of capacity. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll educate people around that. And there's some fantastic uh, avenues through AFAC and others in the um, uh, school. Uh, um, I think it's called the College of Knowledge or something, the school, prescribed burning school. Rog, you, you know it. I, I just, just lost me for a moment. Um, <coughs> but we'll never put a fire out with a prescribed burn, but we'll reduce its intensity, which gives us that opportunity. And if we don't do that well, and you know, it's not a question of where do you put the prescribed burn. It's, we've got a lot of bush, a lot of country out there to try and manage. Um, we won't manage at all, but if we can actually knock down certain spots where we, reduce that fire intensity when it comes, uh, then we'll have um, uh, we'll have better outcomes. Uh, we're never going to have better outcomes if we don't manage that fuel because we'll have scenarios like we've had this year in Gippsland. Um, and that's just, uh, we, we just don't want to see that. You know, I've been over there, been to Gippsland a few times, la well, the last two years I've been over there but in aviation. And before that, I think the first time I went over there was back in about 1990. So, um, uh, fires will always be there, but we're going to try and manage the fuel somehow. And there's a lot of private land out there that just will not get managed by the Crown. We have to be able to facilitate some management. So in, if you don't see it as being as important as jumping on the fire truck and going down the road, I, I challenge you to have a think about that. Because if we, if we don't start doing things a bit differently, then we're never going to have a different outcome. So does that make sense to you guys as well? Yeah. I, think um, I, was, I was about to say, I'll jump in before you do, Roger. There was some absolutely clear and evident in the last two years. Um, last year at Rosedale, a number of places this year, the evidence of burning and the success in, even if it didn't stop the fire, it um, lessened the um, intensity of the fire. So... Um, I'm sure there'll be documents for a nut that there was a really great one last year at Rosedale and there's a number of this year that we've seen the evidence of one side of the road to the other um, and the intensity of the fire change in previously burnt areas. So there's definitely um, that part yeah, well, showing how well burning actually is. I, I don't know when you had Lee Gleeson on what Lee was on talking about. Uh, didn't uh, just Pretty much he's... Pretty much his life up in Alice Springs and oh, his role is there. He had a famous saying, every day's a burning day. <laughs> so does Greg Harry. Yeah, because yeah, I know Lee is passionate about burning things and uh, he uh, uh, he used to do a pretty good job at it. Um, he, he also he had a bit of infancy around a few other a few burns that he did, but that's another story. But the point being is that uh, burn, every day is a burning day, but you've got to get the right weather to do it. 
and that's uh, that's our biggest problem. And then when you have the right weather, you've got to have the people. And if we can't get, if we if we can marry the two of those up, what I'm trying to do is fix the problem about the people, and the big fella upstairs will look about the weather, um, and then we'll manage the fuel. Rog, yours. I was just going to say um, it'll be instructive for all of us to watch the Royal Commission in New South Wales, uh, where this subject has already come up. Um, every after every catastrophic day. And certainly after the Victorian bushfire Royal Commission submissions were received, the greatest number of submissions were about planned burning. Um, mostly along the lines of there wasn't enough. And it's the same, the same after last summer, not enough planned burning. Um, so somewhere or other, we have to get to grips with it in a serious way. That's really all. Also, yeah. another question, is there a Shelley burn camp this year? Uh, no. no. Uh, verbal, verbal information to me is no, they've been exhausted uh, mentally and physically for resources up there post the summer's burns. So they put it off this year. Yeah, they, we just could, uh, with the amount of fire, you know, both Phil Brown and Phil Hawkey, if you both know, both know the guys, they, they'd, they'd had a fairly horrendous season in terms of being out there on the line for, for, for a long time, period of time. And to run those burn camps takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, and a lot of coordination. And they just didn't have the Mitch Emirate, uh, They just didn't have the have the time to do it. So uh, we we will look to have more burn camps. But but as I said, we've got some money in the task force budget, and we will be seeking to actually use that as an an instrument to to do training. And Roger uh, wrote a really good. Uh, um, syllabus and course for conduct a simple burn. And uh, that, that was going to be the, the benchmark or, or the, the, the ground level to get plan burn controllers and people skilled up. And we're still looking, Rog, to you know, get all the number of those people that have done those courses uh, on to burn. So we're hoping that some of those people will come in and join the task force. We can get them out there, get them mentored, get them ticked off and get, you know, so we're looking at some providing those opportunities to do it. Um, well, I can't go let that go past without acknowledging the professional services of people like Rod. Oh, yes, sorry, Rod, I should have uh, mentioned you there. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, also note that Trevor Roach is on the, on the meeting and may have things to say about uh, the northeast fires and plan burning up there. Trev, if you've got anything to contribute there. Hello, hello, Rochi. Maybe not. He's okay. muted. Sorry, I don't know if he's trying to talk or has nothing to say. Are you there, Trevor? No. Okay. And I can see is that is that George O'Dwyer from up at this part of the world? Is that you, George? Again, George is on mute, but yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, yes, Tony, good, good to see you, mate. Yeah, and the same, George, I can't see you. You better turn your camera on. I suppose you've still got that big handlebar going on there, have you, mate? Yeah, <laughs> broke, broke the camera, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice to hear your voice. You've got some honoured people on this uh, this uh, website. That's really good. Uh, so, look, um, I'm not going to rattle on anymore uh, unless anybody got any further questions, but... There are a lot of advocates out there supporting plan burning and, and we just need to see how we can do it better. Um, and it won't happen unless we've got volunteer support out there. And it won't, and, and I think not only about supporting the plan burn, I, 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 I challenge you also to have a look around when you drive around and see where you could put plan burns, where you need to do fuel reduction burning. And then look at going to say Chris Lewis or other people and say, put in a suggestion forward. We're currently in the, somebody made a comment about the joint fuel management planning process at the moment. So we're going through that process of looking at areas where we can do cross tenure burns, where we can engage with FMVIC, where we can actually do solo burns, where we can actually go out and engage with the property owners. So all of those sort of things as a brigade member or member of CFA, you, you've got that ability to go out and promote that. So if you go and find an area where you think that a burn is going to be beneficial or it can be get, get that discussion happening, 
And then if it gets to that stage where we're going to actually be able to deliver it, then the task force can come and support. That's the whole. That's the whole object of it. So hopefully we'll, we we will have success, and um, and provided I've got I've got a pretty big bucket of money there. If I can get people out to Burns, I'll be happy to pay for you to go. So uh, that's about all I've got to say. Thanks very much, Tony, and thanks for your time. Oh, hang on, I've got another question in. What role do you see cultural burning playing within the task force? Um, none. <laughs> I'm not being rude about that. Cultural burning is a complementary program to fuel reduction burning, and I don't want. I don't think. And Roger, you can jump in here and help me if you like. But I, I have a view that that, that fuel reduction burning should not be um, interpreted as cultural or traditional owner burning. Traditional owner burning goes back has its nemesis, our genesis. 10,000 years ago. And traditional burning is, was never done for fuel, fuel reduction as such. It was burned, um, it was used to create a, a residence, it was used for war, it was used for ceremony, it was used for food production, all those sort of things. They didn't think about it as a significant fuel reduction. Now, I, I think what, what I, I'm a great advocate for traditional cultural burning because it's about healing country. And when it's applied, it's applied in a different methodology than what we use to do fuel reduction burning. So it's complementary. And I see it as being, uh, we should be supporting that, but it's not something that the task force would actively go out and support. It, it needs to be done. It needs to be led by the traditional owners in those particular groups, wherever they are, whether it's Wadarong, Wadjigajan, uh, Eastern Ma. It needs to be led by them, and the task force would not be seen going in doing a cultural burn as such. It may be there as a supporting tool if a lot the locals couldn't assist it. So does that make sense? Yeah, I, I support that, Tony. You nailed it pretty well. Um, in answer to Ken Jones's really interesting question, the role I see for cultural burning is to expand our knowledge of of methodology um, we wouldn't do it per se but we would use the principles of cultural burning to expand the way we do our plan burning you know, yeah. no it's a complementary process to what we do to our plan burning yeah. and, and you know we can learn a lot from it and how it's done and you know where it's done uh, and those things we learn by history. I mean, if we COVID nineteen is a pretty good example at the moment. If we didn't learn anything from nineteen eighteen, where where would we be today? Um, and I think uh, when you have a look at the, the if you go back and have a look at the history books, uh, the, the Spanish flu, the actions that were taken in nineteen eighteen are identical to what we're taking today, in two thousand, nearly hundred years later, or oh, hundred years later, over hundred years later. So history can teach us some fine things. And uh, I think that's really uh, the point about cultural or traditional burning. We can learn from those, the people that, that are practitioners in it and we can learn their methodologies and learn new skills. But it's not really about what we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. If there's no more questions, we thank you, Tony, for sharing your info about the Plan Burn Task Force tonight. Um, thank you for Roger for jumping in as well. Um, great to see you and hear from you. And thanks every guys for jumping in tonight. Um, record, this is recorded as per usual. I'll put it up and share the link for anyone that wants it. And I know there's some people have already asked. Um, if Tony, if you want to forward me those documents, I'll put that up on the Facebook page. Yep. Um, and also put it in the link so people can grab that. Yep. And that is about it um next week we actually have lakes um lakes entrance rescue um the guys from lakes entrance brigade will come along show you the rescue talk about how you guys can assist on scene before rescue shows up etc so um that will be um that will be a good one to listen in to um they're already planning that so that will be good so have a good safe week everyone keep warm 
and we'll see you next week. No worries. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for being uh, coming along tonight. Really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you and hopefully see you out there at a burn sometime. And uh, all the best, Rod, Roger and George, who I know personally. <laughs> all right, Tony. Good on you, mate. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, George. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks all. Have a good week.